Hello, I'm Makosi Khabi. In recent years, we have witnessed the normalization of authoritarian, racist, and anti-migrant political stances across Europe. Some of what used to be the selling points of far-right movements and parties has become part of the mainstream in several regions of the world in their politics and the media. At the same time, the pandemic has gifted far-right movements and parties with a fresh wind They've since presented themselves as opponents of the state and international measures to combat COVID. In light of these disturbing trends, scholars across Europe in the fields of sociology, psychology, philosophy, political science and cultural studies came together in a research project called Cultures of Rejection, or CURE for short. CURE consists of five research teams from Sweden, Germany, Austria, Croatia, and Serbia. Here's Manuela Boyajiev, project leader and professor at the Institute of European Ethnology in the Humboldt University, Berlin. Authoritarian politics, far-right parties, right-wing populism, and racism have become acceptable and even desirable for certain sections of society. Our goal is to better understand this social and cultural climate. We call this climate cultures of rejection. It emerges as the result of multiple crises in Europe's democracies, due to changes in national settings and institutions and in civil society. It is the aim of our project to study the conditions that have led to a variety of rejections. Among them, we will find migration, political elites, broadcast media, and cultural values such as gender equality and sexual liberty. The project assumes that transformation in work environments constitute a key part to the present political dynamics. Technological changes, changing market demands, deteriorating work conditions, or de-skilling are taking place in the retails and logistics sectors. First, the researchers spoke to workers in these sectors about their experiences and listened to their stories. Cultures of rejection are however not only present in the workplace environments, they're also present in spaces where people recuperate and take part in cultural life. Spaces in which they carry out necessary chores like shopping, cleaning, and raising of children. Spaces in which they meet and try and make sense of the world that surrounds them. Supermarket checkout lines, gym locker rooms, public Facebook pages, WhatsApp groups, or the counter of the pub downstairs. These spaces of everyday social life shape perceptions about transformation and crisis. This is Alexander Harder, a researcher in Germany. Through mappings of workers' everyday lives, we have identified the digital and the socio-spatial environments relevant to their daily routines. We researched how they contribute to cultures of rejection ethnographically. This means we drew not only on document analyses and expert interviews, but engaged in continuous observation and participation. We are concerned with authoritarianism's culture, and we are devoted to diagnosing the societal conditions under which it erupts, spreads, and thrives. So we ask, how can we foster countercultural conditions that challenge authoritarian politics? Now we'll take a look at the project's first findings. A key aspect of cultures of rejection is the migration movements of 2015 and the stories that are told about them. It's a story that we all know, a story that we've all heard. 
It's an old story about foreigners, strangers and others. It's a story about borders and limits and what happens when they're not respected. The story goes something like this. There's only so much of the other, so much strangeness that a society can bear. If there's too much of it and too many of them, then we must expect a social reaction. It's a story that we've heard time and time again. In the summer of 2015, once again, people fled from poverty and war. They decided to journey to countries such as Sweden, Austria, Germany, Serbia, and Croatia. Most often, they were met and supported in very practical and symbolic ways. In Germany, a new terminology emerged, the Willkommenskultur a welcoming culture. Sure, this term was quickly adopted by politicians wanting to polish their image in the world. But at the same time, it seemed to capture a mood that seemed to emerge that summer. A mood that emerged from small, tiny acts of solidarity. But then the story continues. The climate changed. A wave of attacks followed on migrants and refugees as the summer faded. In order to justify these attacks, a new terminology emerged, the refugee crisis. Far-right political parties and movements profited from that story. What caused this shift? Although many commentators in politics and media were appalled by these developments, at the same time, it was portrayed as an inevitable outcome of too much otherness too many strangers. Isn't this, they speculated, an inevitable, if unpleasant, reflex, a mechanism of self-defense for society to react to the refugee crisis? Benjamin Opratko is a Cure Research team member in Vienna, questioning this story. The story we just heard is, in fact, a familiar one. The French philosopher Etienne Balibar coined a term for it. He called it meta-racism. It's a racist way of explaining racism. Meta-racism is a racism that claims to have learned its lesson. It's a racism that reacts to the challenge of anti-racism. It asks us to understand racist violence, to accept authoritarian politics uh, is something like uh, a feverish immune reaction of society. The body politic, it claims, protects itself against potentially harmful intruders. It suggests that in the end, the best way to prevent racist violence is to limit the influx of potentially harmful, strange others. The story is familiar, and we've heard many variations of it, but none of them hold up when we look more closely. It is clear that there is no correlation between the presence of migrants and the political success of the far right. Racism is not a natural reaction. Racism creates meaning. It orders our experiences, it makes sense of often baffling contradictions. Racism is a venue for comforting social conflicts by exerting violence, by excluding people from communities, sometimes even from humanity as a whole. Its uh, roots are not found inside the minds of individuals, even though they can become obsessed with it. Uh, racism lies in the very material structures of how we live, how we operate in society. Therefore, to combat racism, we, has, we have to understand how figures of the migrant or uh, the refugee or the Muslim emerge, um, how they become meaningful 
for the way people look at their own lives, how they interpret their own worlds. So what are the conditions? What are the conditions in which people live, work, communicate with each other that leads them to embrace not a culture of welcoming, but a culture of rejection? In some cases, cultures of rejection emerge from experiences in changing work environments. Let's look at the example of the Croatian seafarers to better understand the relationship between labor and rejection. This is Rijeka the biggest port on the Croatian Adriatic Sea in the Kvarna Bay. It has become one of the central logistic hubs of global capitalism. Traditionally multicultural and multi-ethnic, with an extraordinarily rich multi-layered history, several times in the past divided and still unique and united. This city is now exposed to the same malice of all former industrial sites. Swift change of its working landscape. Working conditions on container ships have changed drastically over the last years and decades. Tighter security measures, which are often introduced in the name of anti-terrorism, coincided with the emergence of automatization. Marko Luka Zupcic, a researcher with the Croatian Cure Team, describes what that means for seafarers' daily lives. For seafarers, it has become increasingly difficult, if not impossible, to leave the ship while in port. What had been a defining feature of a seafarer's life, the encounter with different people, cultures and places, became increasingly brief, surveilled and managed. Once the agent of multiculturalism, bringing home the experiences and traces of their global journey, seafarers now mostly spend their ever-decreasing free time on board and online. As one of our interlocutors noted, while the museums of seafarers of 20th century abound in artifacts and stories which brought the world into the homes of their families and friends, the museums of the seafarers of 20th century would be almost empty. The researchers also found that weak trade unions contributed to the conditions under which cultures of rejection emerged. A person working on a large ship told us bitterly, our union is known as very bad. They don't care. But for example, the Philippine union is very strong. If their working hours are not respected, their union reacts immediately. I never experienced that. Once one ship from our company was stopped in Australia, salaries were not paid. Filipinos reported their problem and their salaries were paid quickly, but we waited much longer. This is unimaginable in Croatia, and people are unsatisfied and full of resentment. Indeed, often those most prone to rejection are those who are themselves rejected. Left at the mercy of hollowed out institutions and international capitalist regimes in the midst of multiple global crises. Without the support of a union, without an organized collective voice, without the power and influence of a strong community. In this insight, perhaps lies the beginning of working out how to change the key conditions that give rise to cultures of rejection. At the same time, we should not give in to stereotypes of dissatisfied and disappointed workers. They do not automatically react to experiences of crisis and transformation by rejecting authorities and migrants. Cultures of rejection are always mediated by ideologies and myths, by racism and sexism, but also in very material ways in which we act and communicate. Conflicts and grievances are not only discussed on the ships and docks. They're also discussed online, on social media. Their emotions can become distorted, 
In some cases, anonymity can encourage some to express extreme opinions. The open-ended nature of social situations online can aggravate this dynamic. Long streams of extreme speech can constantly pull users back into an increasingly negative emotional spiral. Cultures of Rejection aims to understand the conditions that encourage devaluation and debasement of others and the de-democratizing attitudes. An important factor in this regard are the physical and digital spaces in which social relationships take place today. So, let us look at how spaces of everyday lives, in our homes, in places where we socialize, and digital spaces facilitate cultures of rejection. Let's imagine a map of the spaces that everyday life traverses today. For the German workers that the researchers interviewed, this is roughly what it would look like. Daily routines are perceived as happening mainly between the workplace and their home and their neighborhoods. Conversations with colleagues at the workplace in break rooms, smokers' lounges, or group chats served as the main sites for interaction from coordinating shifts to venting about their work. Outside the workplace, however, spaces of collective sense-making are sparse. Inconvenient working hours in retail leave only little time and energy for civic engagement or cultural activities beyond the necessary daily chores. For others, a desire for flexibility and self-determination led to undertaking those leisure activities that they found time for alone. Digital environments form an exception, of course. Online, it is easier to interact and talk with others. But rather than delving headfirst into an ocean of personally tailored social media content, workers were much more skeptical. The publicity of social media platforms and an exhaustion with the pace of current events has made many wary of online environments and of news reporting in general. The half-private channels of messengers such as WhatsApp and Telegram appear much more relevant than the network publics of Facebook, Twitter, etc. Not necessarily because they are less frantic, but because they are perceived as unburdened by politics. In addition to group chats and private messenger services, another more traditional space is key to the everyday interpretation of experiences, grievances, or current events. One's own private home. At dinner with the family or on the couch with the spouse, people feel secure and protected to actually speak their minds. Looking out from within, society appears threatening. Anxieties about censorship, the feeling that you cannot talk to the people anymore, or a general atmosphere of hostility, justify the workers' retreat into these more private circles. In what appears as a beleaguered position, the researchers encounter elements of a walled subjectivity, closing itself off to the outside world, protecting what is seen as hours and forfeiting the desire to change or impact society in meaningful ways. Scarce resources in terms of time and in terms of emotional capacities justify this decision. The challenge, it seems, 
would be to create space for different, porous and open ways of relating to one, to grow and thrive. Cultures of rejection diminish trust in democratic and political institutions. The case of Serbia illustrates how this dynamic can amount to a widespread disillusionment or a rejection of politics as such, a phenomenon sometimes called anti-politics. Pure researchers in Serbia found sweeping rage and dissatisfaction amongst the people they interviewed and the movements that they observed. These sentiments are expressed as primarily a rejection of politics. Politicians in the political establishment are seen as a malevolent force directly infringing on citizens' personal lives. A deep dissatisfaction with the social conditions in the country sustains this perception. Under these conditions, a vicious circle of social isolation and political alienation emerges. This became apparent to Cure researchers when they observed the 2020 protests against the ruling party's handling of the pandemic. This is Sarah Nikolish, Cure team member at the University of Belgrade. In Serbia, we have found two types of rejection. The first type refers to a negative orientation towards politicians themselves, while the second is directed towards political institutions and the political process in general. What we find here is what French philosopher Jacques Rancière calls anti-politics. He views it as a consequence of estrangement from the public sphere that causes a disavowal of politics and democracy among citizens. The rejection of political elites constructs them as corrupt and as doing politics for their selfish interest only. In anti-politics, the political system itself is perceived as an entity that is beyond citizens' control completely. They believe that their participation cannot meaningfully influence the political outcomes and they feel impotent to induce the change they need. Paradoxically, for politicians, anti-politics can become a way of doing politics. Take this statement by Aleksandar Vucic, President of Serbia, as an example. When I see politicians in the mess, and that is the case of Dragana Marković, I get to get to the end of the day, because these politicians have lied for a million other things, and I don't believe in them. In this case, we find authoritarian politicians mobilizing cultures of rejection in order to hollow out democratic processes and institutions. In 2020, a global pandemic shifted political landscapes in many of the countries researched by the project.
Cultures of rejection have undoubtedly played its part during the COVID-19 crisis. The opposition to anti-pandemic measures often drew on conspiracy myths and spiritualism, while often finding themselves caught in a noxious relationship with established media. When the pandemic hit Sweden, public perception of the government was already damaged by several government crises beginning in 2014. Under pressure from the populist right, the last Swedish elections in 2018 resulted in an unstable ruling coalition and fueled skepticism about its ability to enact meaningful policies. It was within this political context that Sweden experienced the pandemic. The first government responses relied on people's voluntary compliance until January 2021 when tougher restrictions were enacted. Under labels like freedom, sovereignty and truth, protesters opposed the restrictions and rejected official explanations and established media sources. Selina Ortega Soto is a Cure team member at the Linköping University, researching cultures of rejection in Sweden as they relate to the COVID-19 pandemic. In the protests against pandemic restrictions in Sweden, people from both right and left, often inspired by spiritual and conspiratorial myths, challenged the official explanations of this crisis. The melding of conspiracy theory and alternative spirituality is what Charlotte Ward and David Vose termed conspirituality. Although united under placards praising freedom, love, unity and togetherness, many participants ultimately view political change as a question of individual consciousness or personal awakening. We have observed that these movements are caught in a noxious relationship to established media. Many of the diverse protesters reject traditional media sources and praise alternative and supposedly critical news outlets. As the demonstrations got bigger, new demonstrators revealed that it was the negative reporting itself that had inspired them to join the protests. This spiral, which further polarizes the political landscape, might make it necessary to move the conversation to different topics and ask different kind of questions. Across Europe, conspiracy myths played a key role in protests against anti-pandemic measures. Many protesters portray themselves as awakened in contrast to a supposedly slumbering general public. While the protests mobilize masses, a hyper-individualism characterizes most movements against the restriction of daily life and for freedom, sovereignty and truth. But simply labeling protesters as conspiracy theorists only deepens the polarization observed in Sweden and elsewhere. We've seen how suspicions of collective organizing, skepticism towards democratic institutions and a disenchantment with economic transformations predate the current crisis. It is on this level that we should think of cultures of rejection in the COVID-19 crisis and ask different questions to shift the political discussion. By engaging with these problems and by asking different questions, could we change the climate for different types of discussions? Our research into the working and living conditions across Europe highlights current elements of rejection in different local settings. Amongst the most obvious forms of rejection, we found racism, mainly against migrants and refugees. Here, the Cure Research team's starting point was to challenge a popular story, a misrepresentation. Racism is not a natural reaction. It is a venue for social conflicts, a projection of grievances and resentments onto those people which are designated as strangers. Cultures of rejection target both powerful authorities and institutions, and social groups which are subject to exclusion and oppression, such as migrants and minorities. Our research in Croatia showed how this crisis and contradictions of a globalized, logistified capitalism creates local conditions in which such cultures of rejection thrive. And it also displayed how such negative effects are mediated and amplified on social media. 
In Germany, the Cure researchers encountered workers rejecting publicity online and offline. Under the pressure by time restraints and perceived pace of political developments, they retreat into walled and insular social circles. A disillusionment with political efficacy strengthens not only the rejections of politicians, but the cynical rejections of politics in its entirety. As we learned from researchers in Serbia, such anti-politics can paradoxically be mobilized by politicians themselves to strengthen authoritarian agendas. In Sweden, researchers focused on the rejection of scientific authorities and media in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. A mixture of conspiratorial and spiritual anti-establishment thinking shapes this aspect of cultures of rejection, a phenomenon that goes far beyond the case of Sweden. These societal developments are not natural reflexes that set in when work conditions transform and worsen. But right-wing political actors are working massively to give them political direction by reinforcing nationalist media narratives or historically racist discourse. But are they cultivated in daily life? Are they ordering daily experiences and practices? Have they become world views? What we're observing is that the belief in the political is evaporating, while the right tries to actively bypass old forms of politics. Yet they do not succeed in answering urgent questions of our times. So we ask, how do we invent and imagine new world views that are best suited for our times? Thank you. 